Today I'm going to talk about how the pervasion of something small and powerful is changing our interaction with something big and complex. I'm going to do this by using the example of smart cities. And we are going to start by establishing a common understanding of two basic concepts. The first one is the city. Cities have become the dominant habitat of modern society. And the reason for that is quite simple. It's really convenient to live in a city. You get all the services, all the goods you need in very close proximity, so no long distances. And this trend actually leads to the fact that more and more people are moving to cities, a natural evolution. By 2050, another 2.5 billion people will live in cities. And this essentially will make more than 60% of the world's population living in urban areas. And as convenient this is for us, it's quite a task for the city to sustain the citizens. Just think about your average day. You get up, you go to the bathroom, you have breakfast, and at some point um, you head out for work. And for you to do this, the city has to provide you with water, with electricity, with housing, uh, with heat. It has to manage your waste, and it has to provide you with transport. And if you just pick one element again, say for example your breakfast, again, a lot of logistics, um, a lot of cooling, production, everything is involved, and this takes resources and infrastructure from the city. And now if we scale that up to a billion people, you understand that this becomes quite a complex task. And the thing is, this somehow works, but it doesn't really work in the most effective and efficient way. And the reason for that is that we don't really understand every facet of the city because we lack insights. So if you think of it in a holistic way, the city is kind of a black box. So this is concept number one. Concept number two, is something you probably all have heard of. It's the Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is essentially billions of devices that are connected to the Internet and that are talking to each other. And the magnitude of billions is kind of um, a topic of discussion, and I'm not going to throw some random number at you. So let's just agree that there are going to be a lot of devices, and they will cover every area of your daily lives. And this is due to two facts. Number one, computing power got really cheap and small. So, for example, I'm sure pretty much everyone is carrying a smartphone, and the average smartphone today is 30,000 times as powerful as the first computer that was used to send the Apollo to the moon. So, very powerful device, but not just a computer, it's actually a sensor array. You've got accelerometers, you've got gyroscopes, you've got cameras, microphones all sensing the world around you. And the second fact, and the even more important fact about it, is they are always connected. So if you think 20 years back, there was these big boxes uh, that were connected by these loud, noisy modems. And nowadays, you're always online. You're always connected. And this leads to not only you being online, but all of these devices being online. And they are constantly emitting data. And this data is kind of shining a light on different aspects of the city. And if you now scale it up to a billion devices, it's kind of a quite bright light. So one might think it's quite easy. I've got concept number one, my black box. I've got concept number two, these bright lights. I put them together, and suddenly magic happens. And the fact is, it somehow didn't. Because if you look outside, the city doesn't really seem that smart. And the reason for that is also quite obvious, because just putting smart in front of random appliances doesn't really change a lot. So this magic coffee maker that you can actually activate via your uh, iPhone app isn't really that interesting because that's something I can do perfectly fine by pushing a button. And so this is not really a smart city. And people start to think, do I really need this? And what do I need this for? And what I want to, you to do, since we are in the middle of this technological change, and I want you to embrace it, I want you to show what a smart city could look like. And so, let's think about the average day again. You get up at 7 o'clock, 
You like to have a long and actually very fulfilling breakfast. After your breakfast, you take your new shiny electric car, and it takes you around 30 minutes, so you leave your house um, 30 past 8, and you arrive at work at uh, around 9 o'clock. How would this look like um, in a smart city? You will be woken up at 6 o'clock. At first, that doesn't really feel that smart. We all like to stay in bed, so... Um, we need to look at it in a bit more detail. And what happened is actually there was a huge thunderstorm. And due to this huge thunderstorm, several things happened. Uh, the first one was that actually a very important delivery uh, your company was waiting for was delayed. So your boss freaked out and scheduled a meeting at 8 o'clock. We remember usually you get in by 9, so you already have a problem. So that's not the only thing, because the second thing that actually happened is that due to this huge um, thunderstorm, there were roadblocks, um, there are huge traffic delays due to congestion, and last but not least, the electrical grid actually has a problem and um, was falling out. So, what can a smart city do for you now? Well, the first thing is, um, since your usual road to work is blocked, you now need to take a detour. This detour, however, um, is around five kilometers longer. Since um, the electrical grid uh, wasn't working during the night, your new shiny electric car wasn't able to get to a full charge. And due to that fact, today, um, you won't be able to use it in order to arrive at work. So you've got to revert to public transport. However, public transport takes you around 30 minutes longer, so it takes you about an hour to go to work. Now, this information is actually forwarded to your smartwatch, who determines 6 o'clock as being the perfect time for you to wake up refreshed according to your sleep cycle. In another turn, this is also forwarded to um, your smart thermostat that actually um, knows that you will leave the house an hour earlier and it will lower the temperature, hence saving you money. And last but not least, since today you won't be able to have your um, awesome breakfast, at least it starts your coffee machine so you can grab the perfect brew while heading out and um, arriving at work just in time. And so you see, um, a smart city actually helped you to turn a potential not-so-good day into quite the flow day. And this, of course, not only happened to you, it happened to thousands of different people in the city. And now the smart city itself can be smarter about how it uses its resources. And the first thing it can do is actually, since it knows there will be um, more traffic and there will be congestions, more people will use public transport, so it can ensure there are enough trains and there are shorter intervals, so everybody gets um, to work in time. It also reduces the stress on the streets, so they can be fixed faster and there are less accidents. The second thing, um, since a lot of electric cars are standing at home dormant, they can now be used as temporary energy storage devices, hence saving energy and also reducing the impact on the grid, and this also leads to the fact that the grid can be fixed faster. And last but not least, we've got all these smart appliances sitting around that can be activated to the right time, and we remember the thermostat that actually helped not only you save money, it also significantly reduced um, the energy resources need since a lot of thermostats were lowering the temperatures. And in turn, it can be raised to the perfect temperature just in time when you return home. So you see, the real smart city is actually quite a lovable concept. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to embrace this, and I hope you will. Thank you very much.